Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful in Edmonton and around the world. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? So far, so good, Bruce. I got my AstraZeneca vaccine today. Mm. So uh, no side effects so far. Not not dead or anything. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I but think that's I, good. That's very good news. The more the merrier. Where did you get yours done? Just called up at the um, Expo Center. There's a mm -hmm. huge, the huge hall C is set mm -hmm. up for it and uh, hardly anyone there getting their shots today. Yeah. Well, you know, there's been bad, like, honestly, Bruce, there's been bad messaging from the government, inconsistent messaging that would, if, if, if anyone had fears or anxieties about it, the messaging from the government has not helped in the least is what I'm going to say. And, um, you know, even I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll just wait to get the uh, Pfizer or the Moderna and not right. take a chance on the AstraZeneca. But then I thought, ah, if Rachel Notley's going to take one for the team, what, I'm not going to? You better believe I am. So there well, I was. You're, you're in the safe age range, I believe, for that one anyway. They had yeah. a couple of, couple of little hiccups, but it's like one in a million kind of thing. Indeed. So I'd rather take my chances with one in a million than with COVID, personally. You know? Yeah. So I'm not anyway. really that worried about COVID myself. I I'm I work at home. I hardly see anyone. So, but nonetheless, it's it just uh, got to do your bit here. I got to do my. At least that's how I feel. I, I decided thought, to do my bit. I'm I'm not telling anyone else what to do. You make up your own mind. That's my well, thought on it. But sounds I like decided. you made up yours. I read a tweet by Derek Van Deest of the Edmonton Journal today, yeah. showing a wide open spaces, and I'm pretty sure it was that same Expo Center. And he said they just done a fraction. I didn't realize it was AstraZeneca, but yeah, I mean, get get a vaccine, any vaccine would be my. I I wound up getting Moderna from my local pharmacy who squeezed us in. Of course, I'm a little older than you, so I got a little higher up on the pecking order. But uh, I got mine about a month ago, first one. Alrighty, Bruce. Um, we'll get back to vaccine talk in a little bit because it's related to the NHL. But um, the Oilers won today, three to nothing. Uh, they had they uh, they outchanced the uh, the Winnipeg Jets, uh, it, and it was it was I think it was what nine to three, so that's really really good. That's that's Agreed. reversing the trend that we've been seeing lately that I've been worried about and writing about a lot. And uh, the Oilers just looked a lot sharper. They looked like the early more early season Oilers uh, than we had previously seen. So tonight, Bruce, we'll do our two good things, two bad things, and two numbers podcast. And because it is an Oilers win, we'll go do two good things each. What is your first good thing? An Oilers win and a convincing Oilers win. Was uh, it yeah. Uh, there's lots of good things going on in that game tonight, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to single out the forward line of um, Gaetan Haas between... Um, uh, geez, it's been so long, I'm forgetting the names. Dominic Cahoon... And Tyler, Tyler yeah. Yamamoto yeah. on the second line with the Haas filling in ably for the missing Ryan Nugent Hopkins. And the all scrawny line, really. I mean, <laughs> 181 pounds. He's a heavyweight on the line, I think. And, and uh, that's... Um, uh, but they skated well and they defended very, very well. And they attacked like they skated. And, that was, and, they, and they skated in transition. Uh, in particular, I love this game from Dominic Cahoon. I think this is the best he's played as an Oiler. And I loved his game both ways. Like, he made an absolutely gorgeous saucer pass to Yamamoto for a breakaway in the first period where Yamamoto went and made a really nice deke that would have beat a lot of NHL goalers, but not uh, Connor Helbuck, who managed to stretch out and uh, keep his pad close enough to the ice that Yamamoto couldn't quite squeeze it under, but the pass that sent him in was lovely. But uh, Cahoon was also involved in a terrific give-and-go play with Yamamoto that wound up in a, a a good chance. I can't remember if it was even on the net. I just remember the passing play that kind of turned a nothing play into an oiler all of a sudden alone in front with a chance at a, at a one-time uh, deflection. But what I liked most about his play was defensively and how many times he got back and screwed up a play by getting his, his stick in the way or, or 
you know, just elbow grease and, and getting in position and out working jets or at least sawing them off so they couldn't. And he broke up a, a couple of what looked like very promising rushes for the jets that never went anywhere because of the good work of uh, Dominic Cahoon. And again, I'll stress he and these, this line was not the only Oilers who were doing this. The team as a whole was very strong on the two-way game tonight, I thought. They uh, they cleaned up a few messes in their own end, or would be potential messes, simply because they got um, uh, they got back, they hustled their butts, and they uh, got in position, and they made plays when, when they were there. So uh, more power to them, uh, and... That line as a whole, I mean, no goals were scored while they were on the ice, but when your power play pots two and your first line pots one, everybody else sawing off is exactly what you want, and that's what they got. Cahoon's interesting because there, early in the year, there was quite positive feeling about him and the thought, oh, he's probably going to earn a new contract. And I think that's kind of very much in the balance right now, but he could mm-hmm. still, obviously, still if he were to turn it on. And, and this is the kind of play Bruce that he has to have to win yep. a new contract. He's got to raise his work rate. Yep. He's got to dig in harder and move his feet faster. And that's what he did tonight. Both ends of the ice. I, I just yep. noticed that he was just quicker getting in there and more aggressive getting in there, less passive. And uh, maybe it was being on more of a checking line, right? Like a less, like there's not a line. He's not with Leon Dreisaitl, who you know, kind of slows things down and dominates. You know, he's looking for Dreisaitl. It kind of changes the tempo. And the feel of the line, maybe it suits him more, a line like this, a third line. You know, as a third line player, maybe he's going to work out um, as, a, as opposed to uh, playing higher up, higher up in the batting order. But uh, uh, we'll see. You know, he's, this is one game. Let's see if he can do it again and again and again. He's got to get that work rate at a very high level. Yes. So he did so tonight. Bruce, uh, I'm going to single out for my first good thing, another hard worker, Yessa Pugliarvi, who... Um, was rewarded with a goal tonight. He, uh, McDavid pa- passed the puck out to him in the slot. Pugliarvi got open in the slot. He found the quiet sure ice and he drained it, which he doesn't always do. So that was, that was great. But I, I was thinking of naming him before that, actually, because he was just, he was so effective on the forecheck all night long and, and kind of popping pucks, popping pucks. I was starting to think of, he, he's like uh, the Finnish word for, for pop and pucks is Pulley RV because he, he just did it all game, all game long worse. It was, it was very, very impressive. He was more popping than a bag of uh, microwave popcorn. You know, he was, he was active and I just, I just think that there's a, he can stick on the top line, even if he's not, let's say he gets 1.5 points per game, 1.6 in there. He's got to raise it a little bit. But he, if he does that, he's going to earn his spot on the top line, and he earned it tonight. Yeah, well, on that uh, on that two nothing goal, which really t- cemented the game in Edmonton's direction, I thought uh, Paul Yarby made a terrific defensive play, maybe thirty seconds earlier, where it looked like Mark Scheifele was open for a great chance, and, and uh, uh, one of the commentators possibly. Um, Tell you, Rudy, but I wouldn't say for sure. But one of the commentators in the post game criticized Shifley for muffing the shot. But the replay I saw saw Yusuf Pugliarvi recognize the danger man, close in, stretch out his stick, and just get a chunk of Shifley's stick just as he was trying to let it go. Same kind of plays that the that the Jets were doing to McDavid uh, frequently in this game. But this Pugliarvi came from like the forward position, but he recognized the danger and he did something about it. And he, uh, he disrupted that shot. And so Shifley, instead of having a great chance and possibly a goal, uh, the play went the other way and the, the Oilers won it in the corner with uh, Pugliarvi involved in that, you know, getting possession deep. And then he rolled off his check, Kyle Connor, who kind of got mesmerized by McDavid and the puck and, and uh, two guys went to McDavid, and nobody covered Paul Yarvey, and the puck came out. And yes, uh, well, he kind of he kind of woofed it, but he fluttered it into the top corner. Like he he didn't get all of it, but he got under it, and he got it up and over. And it didn't have to be a hard shot if it hit the right spot. And that's basically what wound up happening. And that's great. I mean, that's the first goal he scored against an actual goalie in a good long time. He scored. He got one empty netter here. Uh, a couple games back, and other than that, he's been uh, 
uh, quiet on the goal scoring front, but to get a goal and get one that he so richly earned is a ter- should be a terrific confidence boost. Kind of stabbed that puck into the top of the net, but that's that's exactly the play. You, that's you fine. Want to get it and get it, up. get it up and and score. You know what I'm? It's he's playing a very kind of um, humble game, Bruce, because he's constantly reading off McDavid and Dreisaitl and trying to you know find where he can fit in. And as soon as he gets it, he's looking to move the puck to them. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you're with, maybe if it was just McDavid, uh, Pugliarvi, and another not dry sidle kind of player, you'd want him to do more with the puck. But when, when you're with right. those two guys, you actually do want him just to get them, them the puck. And he does it constantly. He's constantly looking for them, move, getting the puck as quick as he can to them. Um, so he, he that takes smarts. And it also takes a fair amount of, you know, he's being, he takes some humility. Like he's not thinking, like Neil Yakupov, for instance, would never have played that game. He never would have done that. He just didn't have that in him to be that kind of support player. But Pugliarvi Pul- Pul- does. And uh, um, to his credit, and it's it's fairly effective out there, the octopus. Yeah. He's in the Essa Tikkanen role, maybe. Yeah, Not because he's a Finn, but just because of the grinding and board work that he does, he does it in a different way. But he does that's that's where he's effective. Man, he was on the puck on the board all night, like he was all over that uh, that puck. And was he ever? Bruce, he pops more pucks than the city gives out photo radar tickets on the uh, on the end day, <laughs> and that's saying a lot. All right, 142nd Street between 104th and 106th Avenue by the fire station. That's where I keep getting out. How about Scona Road? How where about suddenly uh, drop the speed limit from 60 to 50 with no apparent change in road conditions? Don't like well, I'm that glad one. you've joined the I Hate Photo Radar Society, Bruce. <laughs> Charter, oh, Charter. Man, I, I don't use it. <laughs> I get them when I'm in an unfamiliar part of the city when I, and I'm just driving with the flow of traffic, you know, and I don't know, uh, don't know the city too well in that spot. And that's where you're going to get hammered because, uh, driving with the flow of traffic in Edmonton is uh, a costly matter. All right. What's your second good thing? That could be our bad thing, but what's your topic? Uh, Yeah, that could be our bad thing. That's right. We don't have much to choose from tonight on that department. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to single out the workhorse, Leon Dreisaitl, who played a monstrous 27 minutes and eight seconds tonight. 24 shifts, both of which led the the forwards, uh, and he uh, of course led the team in even strength and power play time. But he also played 38 seconds on penalty kill, and that doesn't sound like much. 38 seconds on the penalty kill. But you know what? The Oilers had four defensive zone face-offs on the penalty kill, and Leon Dreisaitl took all four of them. And oh. he, he won two. He lost two where, you know, they had to get possession and get it out. But he played four shifts, totaling 38 seconds. So, in other words, the Oilers were pretty efficient at getting the puck either directly off the face-off win or, or, or messing up the power play and getting it down. And Leon got off. It's the old Fogo role, that uh, face-off, get-off role that Manny Malhotra made <laughs> famous when he was with the uh, Vancouver Canucks, and that's what he did in, all the time. He was a D-zone face-off specialist, and his job was to win the face-off, get the puck into the neutral zone, and get replaced by a Sedin. But uh, Leon has added that role, and of course on the other special team, he plays the whole two minutes, so he still has a high average shift rate, but he has four penalty kill shifts tonight, average nine and a half seconds. And overall, he went 12 out of 18 for 67 percent on a night that all of his teammates won eight face-offs and lost 20. So I mean his impact in the face-off circle compared to what the rest of the order seem to be capable of is enormous and it you know I thought it was effective there and it was effective on the power play. I'm pretty sure one of those power play goals was off a cycle that was started by a face-off win. I'd have to go back and look, but I know they started with the puck a few times. And just let me check here on the power play. Leon was uh, five for five, 100%. So they started with the puck on the power play, and they started with it half the time on the penalty kill, and it was all Leon. 
Manny Malhotrebrus, I remember he he got. I don't. I have never seen a player get lower for a face off. It was like he was lying down on a bed, face down, and he was like going to kiss the ice. He was so close to the ice surface. And if I'm not mistaken, the NHL changed their face off rules in in part because of Manny Malhotra. I'm not exactly sure what what the difference was, but I think that there was some alteration in the rules in part because of the way he and others were taking face-offs. But Boyd, you, Boyd. you have to fact-check me on that. Yeah, Boyd, Boyd got pretty low, but M- Manny he was the would lay down king. on the job. Yeah, that's right. How low can you go? Down uh, one knee time after time. But yeah, they, they, they did something about that style of because it was, I don't know if it's too effective, but it just was too oh, mucky. Like there's too many <laughs> sort of sawed off draws where the puck went nowhere and there was a pile up right on the puck. And, but uh, yeah, he, he and Alain Vigneault, he started the Fogo uh, craze and he ran Malhotra like 80% defensive zone starts. Like he, it was really extreme and it worked. Like give full credit to Alain Vigneault. He found the guy for that role on that very good Canucks team from uh, 2010 or so. And uh, that was, that was, he had one job and that was it. Whereas Leon Dreisaitl has many, many jobs. I mean, tonight he played 27 minutes. He had nine shot attempts to lead the Oilers. He had uh, two takeaways, a block shot, and an excellent performance in the faceoff dot, like, and two assists. So nice to have a guy that can do all of those things and play center or wing while he's doing them. (laughs) <laughs> that led the team with three grade A scoring chance shots oh, as well. Yeah, yeah in the second so, period, eh? he had three great chances in the in the middle frame. Correct. Bruce, my my second good thing will be Dave Tippett, and um, you know, I, I just thought this was a perfect Dave Tippett win. Uh, this is the the fact of the matter is the orders are they play the trap right now. <laughs> They're a trap and team. They they hang back in the neutral zone very often and they let and they're you know the center's n- not even deep in the um offensive zone and they just they just make you earn it and the trap played very very worked very very well tonight i mean winnipeg hardly had anything and this is a very good winnipeg team there's very good excellent players on this team but uh dave tippett knows how to teach defensive hockey uh you see i think the oilers it's the best fundamental defensive play from the Oilers that I've seen certainly since we started to track scoring chances, you know, a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Now that's not necessarily saying a lot because a lot of those teams were terrible, but a lot of those teams um, could have been a lot, heck of a lot better. I think if maybe if they had had a coach uh, like Tippett who really knew how to get through to the players, what their roles were and defensively what, what job they had to do and, I just think we're noticing um, players like Juju Kara, Gaetan Haas, uh, Josh Archibald, they're, they're Alex Chason, uh, even Zach Cassian tonight. They're really coming up big with defensive efforts consistently, mm-hmm. excluding Cassian from that list. He's been a little off and on lately. And w- when the defense starts to get it together, when, when when he figures out his defensive pairings and they stop leaking chances against and they keep clean sheets as they did tonight, most of the defensemen, then you get this kind of stifling uh, defensive play. And and I don't mind it at all, Bruce. I, re- I really like it, actually. Uh, I mean, I like the super aggressive offensive play, but I, I, I love sound uh, defensive fundamentals. And Maybe it's because we track these scoring chances right. where, you know, we're figuring out who makes the mistake. So it starts to drive you crazy when you see the same mistake, especially, you know, the the, the mistake that Winnipeg made on Pulley RV's goal, right? Not covering him at all. That's the mistake Watch. you cannot have. And I hate more than anything else. And I can't imagine why NHL players make that mistake, but they all, they must be, must be really hard not to at that level because they, they do constantly. So the Oilers didn't very much this game. And uh, the Jets did it a key moment, and they paid for it. Yep. So uh, this is Dave Tippett's influence, I think. it's Defensively, it's a positive influence. Yeah, they said, uh, announcers made the point with about five minutes left that the Oilers were playing Dave Tippett hockey and shutting yeah. her down. That's basically what they were doing. I mean, we made the same point a couple of weeks ago or a week ago or whenever the heck it was. Oh. They played the last game. Maybe it was a month ago <laughs> in Two Ottawa. Years. 
Yeah. <laughs> when uh, when they got the lead, when Devin Shore scored on the deflection with like five or six minutes left, and then the Oilers just kind of killed the rest of the clock, and Mike Smith that was in net like he always was for Tippett and kind of looking after the the final details as he did again tonight. But uh, it was such an exceptional team effort tonight, David, that I know neither of us named Mike Smith the shutout maker as one of our good things but yeah i mean he didn't he had something to do we're going to get to that yeah, but he yeah. didn't have a whole lot to do yeah, no he was part of the part of the big team effort but it wasn't like he stood on his head all night long nothing close to that bruce what would you say was your bad thing tonight yeah my bad thing is uh, I'm, I'm having a, a, a real hard time finding a bad thing out of that hockey game which is a wonderful thing to, to have to say so I'm going to kind of default back to the, the mess that's led up to this with all of the rescheduling, all of the changes of games, and what the Oilers have had to go through in the last... Since they beat Winnipeg here in Edmonton 4-2, four weeks ago um, uh, tonight, they play... This is their ninth game in 28 days, in a season where you're supposed to be averaging almost a game every other day. And they had three games scheduled against Montreal that got postponed and one that got made up in a, in a tough spot. They had f- three games against Vancouver that got postponed and one that was supposed to be made up and then it got postponed. They had a game moved up. Uh, they had a Calgary game from late in the season moved up to last Saturday, the day of the Colby Cave Memorial. That wasn't, wasn't a good thing at all. And they played poorly. Uh, so it's a it's a combination good thing bad thing in the sense that what the team has had to go through has been pretty tough. I mean, not as tough as one of the teams that's been inflicted with uh, with COVID, of course. Um, but the way that they've responded to it overall has been pretty good. I mean, they're five two and two in those nine games, and they had every reason to be either bagged as they were in the two losses, or super rusty as they were in a couple of the other games that they somehow managed to win anyway. So. They've overcome the bad thing that's been the the incredibly difficult schedule, David. I don't think even the WHA have ever had a, a schedule of the you know the Minnesota folding Saints era. I don't think they ever had a schedule that was as chaotic as this one has been. It's just nuts. And so, I think it would bother uh, some people more than others, Bruce. Mm-hmm. Like some people are kind of go with the flow and they're yep. more spontaneous, but the the people that really need order and routine. Yep. And hockey players are often in that category. Yep. It would drive them crazy. But so it probably depends. Like, it's not like they've been overworked or, or like too many oh. games. But so it's more like just kind of rolling with it. So I think Tippett's been giving a good message on the whole thing. It's just like, you know, kind of control, like the serenity prayer. What is that control of things? You know the difference between what you control and what you can't. And, yeah. And uh, he, he seems to be like, whatever, you know, whatever happens, happens, and we'll just roll with it and, and do our thing. So he's giving the right message to the team on that regard. The other thing is that out of those nine games they played in the last 28 days, eight of them were on the road. That's and true. They still went 5-2-2. Two, and two. So that's a sign of a team that's been able to roll with the adversity. And they, the, the two that got them were the two games that weren't scheduled until they did get scheduled at the end of road trips. And they got... Yeah. They were both trap games, and they got trapped in both of them. They rescheduled they all, losses. <laughs> they probably all raised their skills at video games to a new high by now. I'm guessing. I wonder if they sit around in the in their rooms, the hotel rooms, and they're like, like, like my teenage son is, you know, talking. You know, okay, you shoot him, shoot him dry, shoot him. No, I got him. Oh, oh, he's gonna get me. You know, like they're they're all sitting there, uh, five, six or seven or eight of them playing a video game all at once. I bet you they are. They're all in different rooms. Yeah. Yeah, all in different rooms, but playing uh, they're playing video games together. Uh, my bad thing. I'm gonna. I am gonna stick to something in the game. There, there was a couple. There was two grade A's, three grade A scoring chances against. Of course, one of them was a deflection off Darnell Nurse. But um, I'm gonna go with the kind of the uh, a key moment in the game. The game in the middle of the second period was uh, was tied. Uh, excuse me, it was one nothing Edmonton. And as, as we're, there's about, there's about uh, two and a half minutes left and Winnipeg uh, has a um, power play and the owners get a chance. 
think it's Nurse and uh, Yamamoto rushing up on the ice on a two-on-one. Now, you got to know this is a fraught situation. You got a two-on-one. That means there's one guy, but then there's four guys on the other side of you. And if you lose the puck, those four guys could get a four-on-two. So you'd think the other guys that are, the two guys that are back for the Oilers, they're going to stay back and play it really cautious. But Devin Shore didn't. And um, after Nurse, uh, his pass went astray in the goalie crease, right. Devin Shore kind of lurched to get the rebound. And it wasn't even a rebound. It was it was way to the side, and it wasn't it wasn't a particularly dangerous uh, spot for the Winnipeg Jets. Like it wasn't like he was going to pounce on it and get a good shot. Right. And he didn't win the puck. And what what goes what happens is Winnipeg immediately gets it and shoots in, uh, shoots the puck up ice, and Mark Shifley gets a breakaway. The last guy probably you'd want having a breakaway for the Winnipeg Jets. And fortunately, Mike Smith stoned them. It was a huge moment in the game. If Winnipeg had scored late in the second period to tie it up, get the momentum, who knows what happens in this game. And it's just one kind of mental error by Devin Shore at the wrong moment that led to that. So that's my bad thing. Yeah, with with Nurse and the rush with another forward who committed, I think it was Yamamoto that jumped up with, with Nurse. Yeah. Nurse try, tried to make a little bit of a fancy pass. I, I kind of wanted him to bury his head and fire that puck on net myself. But he tried to feed it across the goal mouth, and Hellebuck got his got his paddle on it, broke up the pass, and so now Nurse and, and Yamamoto are like on the on the icing line, and Devon Shore has one job, and that one job is to cover for Nurse. The defenseman yeah. jumps up for yeah. the forward. The forward has to cover for the defenseman in many situations, but on the penalty kill, that you know, can't stress it enough. I mean. You think, well, if I jump in, we have a three-on-one. Yeah, but if that doesn't work out, they have a four-on-one. So, you know, that's why you want that second guy back at all costs. So it was a mental error, and Winnipeg made him pay for it up to the point where Mike Smith had to make an excellent save, but he made it, and so he got them all, especially Shore, off the hook. I like Devin Shore a lot as a winger. I do, too. I don't really like him as a center or as a penalty killer. Um, either I, I would prefer to see actually see Pulley Arvey get a chance at those minutes and see how he could do because I think he would do uh, very well. So, but I think he with, played more PK minutes than anybody else in the forwards. Sure, two minutes and twenty two seconds. So mm-hmm. obviously Tippett seems to like him. Yeah, well maybe he he does. Tippett probably has it right, and I probably have it wrong. Let's just take that as a well, given. Or that can ha- sometimes that can happen just because a guy gets stuck in his own end for, <laughs> That's for also an entire long shift. I don't remember that happening though. But he uh, he's uh, found his way into the PK rotation with the bullet, Devin Shore. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So maybe I'm just there's a couple mistakes that have stuck out in my mind. Or like remember that one where he dropped his stick and then instead of trying to block the shot, he had to go pick up his stick and they scored. That's kind of stuck in <laughs> stuck in my memory ever mm-hmm. since then, but maybe it's not fair to Devin Shore. Bruce, let's move on and talk about our numbers. What is your number? Okay, I'm going to go with uh, number 18 to 3. Uh, that is high danger chances as per natural stat trick. And their high danger chances in a way mirrors our grade A scoring chances. Uh, theirs is auto-generated, though, by shot location, shot type, and uh, they also include some shots that we exclude, like shots that miss the target and so on. But they had in the entire game uh, Winnipeg with uh, three high-danger scoring chances. They had one in each period, and they had one at five-on-five five and one at, on the power play. And one in the other, in another situation at even strength, which would have been the four on four very early in the game when Tucker Poolman got alone in the slot and tested Mike Smith in the first half minute of the game, I think it was. And uh, it was uh, so they identified the exact same three and only three grade A scoring chances that we did. And they credited the Oilers with uh, six, seven, and five in the three periods. So three more in each period that they credited the Oilers, but they. The, the key number there is the three. And at even strength, they're five on five. It was four against, w- or 14 to one. 14 to one for the Oilers. This in a game where the shot clock says it was a close game. And 
the scoreboard says, well, Edmonton won, but, you know, did the goalie steal it? No, they dominated uh, play, and they shut down uh, uh, good chances against, and they generated some excellent chances of their own. I mean, Hellebuck was cold in Winnipeg in the game there for a chunk of it. Yeah, they'll, they'll typically have higher totals than us because they, they count missed shots, and they also count dribbling shots, like slow yeah. little shots that um, that aren't, if they're just taken from the right spot, because they, they don't measure velocity yet. Uh, in the NHL stats. So they don't pick up on that. In the future, they probably will record velocity and maybe they'll have a way for disc- discounting those kind of little dribbling shots from a, 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 a service that does it automatically. Bruce, my number is um, 36 to 15. And that is the number of breakaways that the Oilers have had this year compared to the opposition. Oh. Edmonton had two breakaways tonight to one for Winnipeg. There was uh, Yamamoto and Chase Anu both had breakaways and Shifley for the Jets. The, it was that this is a a typical ratio though for the whole year, 36 to 15, the owners get a lot more. This is because Carter McDavid has on his own 14 breakaways. The interesting thing is that even with that huge gap in breakaways over the opposition, the owners have scored five goals and the opposition of on breakaways and the opposition have scored four goals on breakaways. So they won't Edmonton for all of those breakaways only has that one goal edge. And uh, I don't know if that's what does McDavid have on his 14? One, one oh. goal on his 14 breakaway chances. So the, 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 the rap on Wayne Gretzky was he couldn't score on breakaways. That well, was. we'll see. I don't know if this is, Typical of McDavid over his career. We, you know, we, we haven't tracked breakaways, I don't think, for his entire career, but we are doing it now. So uh, it, we'll, we'll keep doing that, that going forward. Our, our definition of breakaways is maybe a little different than, than some people. We're, we're talking about when a guy is alone and clear for a shot. Not necessarily he's behind the defense from center in and he's Correct. skating in alone on the goalie. But when he when he's completely in the clear, nobody around him, when he somehow got behind the defense, uh, he can beat them low in the zone or they can mess up and sort of turn the puck over to a guy that can walk in on the goalie. But if he's in position where it's just him and the goalie and he's got room to shoot or make deeks, then that's uh, that's what we would call a breakaway. Am I right? You're the... Yeah, and some people might call it a partial. Some of what we count as a breakaway might count as a partial breakaway. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so Cassian had a tip. He was in behind everyone else, and he had a tip, but we didn't count that as a breakaway because he didn't have full control of the puck to to make a move on the goalie. That's didn't essentially our definition. If you have full control of the puck, you're in on the, in on the goalie alone, even if it's just at the last moment, really. You know, it, but if you have that opportunity to deke the goalie, we count that as a breakaway, so... Um, so the Oilers, I, I don't know what to make of that, Bruce. I mean, 30, you'd expect about a third of the, a third of the breakaways to end up in goals. I think that's what, that's what happens in, uh, the shootout. Yeah. So the Oilers have had 36, they should have about 12 goals, right? Like, uh, uh, but they've got five, maybe, maybe, uh, we'll, they'll start converting more and that'll be good news for Edmonton. We'll see about that. It's been the ratio on penalty shots forever. One out yeah. of three. That's way before the shootout era. Um, so the next game is what night? Monday night? Monday and Wednesday, they play Montreal Canadiens here in town. Montreal, who was soundly thumped for nothing by Ottawa Senators on their home ice this afternoon. So this was a very good day for the Oilers. They gained two clear points on both Montreal and Winnipeg. But uh, Montreal will come out here now with a burr in their saddle. And the Oilers will actually be at home for for once after, you could call it a five-game road trip, but it seemed like about three different road trips, didn't it? (laughs) I mean, this one to Winnipeg is kind of a standalone for sure. Anyway, uh, uh, they're playing Montreal both those games, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and then they have another four days off. And then it gets pretty hairy. I think they play 10 in the next 17 days or something like that. And they have a whole stack of games against Vancouver if we ever get to that. Point. I mean, uh, COVID may have a couple of surprises in store for us yet. Well, they might be going on one big road trip for the playoffs, apparently. According to Elliot Friedman and Chris Johnson, who were talking between periods, they, they were talking about all four Canadian teams perhaps going down to the United States for to play in a bubble in the United oh. States. I don't even know if they would need to play in a bubble anymore, Bruce, if they're down there. I, I mean, by then, um, with the American vaccination rate. 
and and Johnson mentioned that the Canadian, you know, NHL teams might actually get vaccinated down there, which would, you know, they're vaccinating people, everyone over the age of 16. Maybe they should there. go to the Expo Center. They can't. They're not allowed. <laughs> they're not allowed to get the AstraZeneca because wow. uh, they're too young. Doesn't work. Yeah. I I would have happily delayed my own va- vaccination if, if one of those guys wanted to get it before me. But uh, yeah, so we'll see what happens. Bruce, I actually think that the... It, it's hard to know because like the in Canada, it's been slow up until now, obviously. There's delays in the Moderna right now, but there's they're going to get more Pfizer. I'm just hoping, you know, I think they've talked about, a, if I'm not mistaken, about 36 million doses in this three-month period in Canada between uh, the beginning of April and the end of June. 36 million, that's a lot of doses of vaccine. So I'm hoping that the players and and the, will get vaccinated sometime in early June, probably. I'm I'm and uh, if we can get up to high vaccination rates and the and the te- Canadian teams stick around long enough, we may see actually fans in the stands for for the playoff rounds, and I think that would be fantastic. So I I prefer at this point to be a vaccine optimist. As critical as I've been of the Trudeau government's vaccine procurement policy, the vaccines are rolling in now, and I'm 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 hoping that we'll be able to open up sooner than later and get fans in the stands and keep our playoffs here and get the players vaccinated and get over this freaking nightmare. So, yeah, this nightmare that we can't wake up from that nightmare. (laughs) We wake up every day and it's the same one. Yeah. Right. So tonight, David Bakersfield Condors are playing a home game in front of fans. First one. Whoa. Wow. Really? Yeah. Small numbers of fans. Uh, One of our, uh, uh, loyal uh, watchers and followers on Twitter, uh, Eastern Refugee, Rich. Yeah. Uh, he filled me in on some of the details there about how I think they only have six home games left, but they're going to start letting uh, letting people in. Uh, they're playing right through to the 16th uh, of May. And whether or not there's playoffs remains to be seen, but there's a hell of a lot likelier to be playoffs if there's fans and they can make some money doing it as opposed to if it's just a longer expense for the owners to, to run a game in front of empty buildings. So Rich liked the chances of there being at least a uh, Pacific Division playoffs where the top four get in and, and I'll just go for division honours. And I'll, I'm happy with playoffs of any description. The experience for these young fellows down there is golden. And by then, we even could have uh, young Dylan Holloway uh Getting some of that experience, the guy, the youngster who signed a contract yesterday with the orders, but he's about four weeks away from uh, being able to play, so he's almost certainly going to be uh, assigned to Bakersfield. He's already in the states, and uh, in uh, Wisconsin, uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So, but he may well wind up on the Condors. But whether he plays two games or a lot more depends on whether they go to play playoff games. So hopefully they will. Yeah. And this is in California, where they have been typically far more restrictive than many other areas. They're not exactly Texas there, put it that way, or Florida. So mm-hmm. the fact that they have fans in California, that's really kind of eye-opening. Although maybe they have different rules in Bakersfield. It's more like Texas and Bakersfield than it is in, you know, they got a different uh, different vibe in Bakersfield. But I, I'm imagining they have statewide rules. And the fact that there are fans there is is quite encouraging. And and I, I, I agree with you, Bruce. It's, playoffs would be really important for all of those players um, to have that experience. So uh, there, there is a much bigger chance right now because of that. Just wait for a month from now, you know, they'll have so many more people vaccinated and um, doubly, and they're getting double vaccinated down there in the United States. They're not, they don't have to wait. They're getting both their shots. So there, there's going to be lots of people in a month from now who are going to be able to go to the game. So I'm, that's, uh, that's excellent news. Yeah, the con- they're playing tonight at 8 o'clock Pacific time, 9 o'clock our time. So the game hasn't even started yet, and the Oilers game is over. So while I'm writing the game grades, I'm going to have the Condors game running on one of my screens here and keep track of that. They they won one nothing last night in Ontario, and they're winning a lot more than they're losing. they they got a good thing going on down there, Jay Woodcroft and his crew. They do. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there. Thanks for talking tonight. All right. Thanks, for winning Oilers and thanks for listening everyone <laughs> and in the meantime and in between times this has been another edition of the cult of hockey podcast <laughs>